Joel's prophecy, as I said when I started this, is the birth of the New Testament church. Joel's prophecy is exactly what Peter came out of the upper room after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in other tongues, and that experience, 120 came out, and when they came out of the upper room, the Bible says that Peter went straight to the square there in, uh, in Jerusalem, and he began to preach, and he quoted uh, out of the book of Joel, and that was the text of his first message. So the first message ever preached was out of the book of Joel. And there's a group in the church today that they're inheritors. All they think about is what they get for nothing. But we need a generation of harvesters to rise up where they sow with a seed so there'll be a future food to eat. Verse 20, and for the rivers of water are dried up and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. How many of you know dryness comes and the, and, and the water's dried up? The water is the word, saints. See, when the word stops being preached, when you are posing the word, you've got to understand something. You're going to start to dry up. You're going to dry up. You're going to be dust. And listen to me. Demons like dry places. Demons like dry places. So when you get dried up because there's no wet water in you of the word, you become a candidate for demon possession. Joel chapter 2 verse 1, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. We talked about it at watch night service, the blowing of the trumpet in God's house. Notice the first thing, it is a trumpet. That is a prophetic mouthpiece. And the prophets in the house of God need to open their mouth and speak prophetically. We need to know that it said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow it in Zion. God will not do anything to destroy outside until he brings judgment inside. The culture, and the word culture there has one word as a definition, means religion. So the, the culture of our time, the present time, is a form of religion. Tolerance has become one of its uh, main uh, doctrinal issues. When it has no tolerance for Christians, but it has tolerance for everything else. And he said, include fasting and prayer. And as you include fasting and praying, you're going to see your spiritual level come up. Have you hear me? And if you really want to grow in God, then you need to make fasting a part of your life. He said, I'll answer my people. And he said, behold, uh, I will send you corn, wine, and oil. And you shall be satisfied therewith. How many of you are hearing me today? Yeah. How many of you know that there's going to come a day, a remnant, whoever that will be, that those people are going to absolutely be more satisfied with the oil and the wine and the meal of God than they are with anything the world has to offer? Amen. Our problem today is that we're not satisfied with Jesus. We want something else. We're not satisfied with the world, uh, the word. Look, that's why a lot of the children don't come to church. A lot of the children grow up, turn 18, and never want to come back in the house of God. And the reason is because many times uh, they are finding pleasure in other things or amusement in other things rather than in the word and the anointing and in the joy of the Lord. The Lord will thunder and roar from Zion. Oh, you got to get this. Now, there's one thing when God roars from heaven. That's powerful. But when God starts to roar from Zion, oh, man, look out. That means God's in our midst. 
and the sound of God is emanating out of the house of God. Can you hear me now? It's one thing to hear God roar, like it says in Jeremiah, from heaven. But this says, and God will thunder and roar from Zion, from his church. And he'll utter his voice. And that means you and I will open our mouth. And when we do, it'll be the voice of God. Listen to me. The lying spirits that are out there today in this culturally PC acceptable Christianity will try to tell you that God can show up in just anywhere. Listen to me, God doesn't just show up in anywhere. Can God show up in anywhere? Sure, he's God, but he don't just show up in anywhere. He has places that he writes his name. He has places uh, that he loves to dwell. He loves to dwell in the hearts of the righteous. Uh, God uh, wants to live amongst us and in us. How many of you know we're coming into a new place and God's creating a new wineskin and here's what you need to understand that foreigners that just pass through for a temporary touch of God will be no more. Churches are filled with visitors instead of inhabitants. Joel chapter 3, 1 through 21. Now, I did that again so that you'd understand that sequence is exactly what God does with us when he's ready to move us to a new place. How many of you know people are in a new place today to decide, will you serve the Lord or will you serve God? Mammon. Which God are you going to serve? You can see it by giving. You can see it by people's tithes and offerings. People are more in love with mammon than they are with Jesus. Hello? And that day is, is so fast coming to an end, we're going to find the suddenly of God. You mark what I tell you, 2017 is going to shake people to the core of their life. We are slaves. Hello? We get saved. We're no longer a slave to sin, but we're a slave to the Lord Jesus by a bond chosen slave. I choose to be his servant. I choose to be his slave. It's bond slave. That's what Paul said. Now, in this process, uh, so important to understand that we are having the reverse of captivity. That's why it's important. I shall reverse the captivity. In other words, I'm not taking you out of captivity. I'm just reversing it. No longer are you in captivity by Babylon, but you're in my captivity, says the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you want to be a prisoner of the Lord? I choose to be a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bond slave. Come on, saints. In the book of Joel, here it talks about in the last days, and that's what Peter prophesied, said your old men will see uh, dream dreams, your young men will, uh, I mean, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. How do you know dreaming uh, is a form of a release of the anointing prophetically for direction? That's what happened in, in, in Joseph's day. Dreams came to Pharaoh. Joseph had a dream. And the dream of the world and the dream of God joined together and caused something to change in the culture. A man named Joseph had a dream and he ran into a Pharaoh who had a dream and the dream of God trumped the dream of the world. You see, there are people around you that don't want you to get free. Look, there, there, I could go somewhere right here. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of black people that are not free because a lot of black people don't want them to be free. So we preach messages to keep people in bondage so we can keep making money. Psychiatrists don't want you healed because they won't make any money if you get healed. 
The pharmaceutical industry don't want you healed because they won't make any money. This is the third day, the day of the resurrection. How you know we're 2,000 years since Jesus died and we're at the threshold of the third thousand, which is the beginning of the restoration of all things. That's why it's called the third day. Have you know Jesus on the third day rose up? Have you know on the third day the church is coming back alive? The church is coming out of uh, the tomb. Have you say, Lord, I'm a third day Christian? Yes. Hallelujah. The Lord will bring again uh, the captivity of Judah, the first fruits company. This is the Hebrew word meaning to restore or bring back is the word Joel uses, meaning turn or return. I mean, the Lord uses in chapter two, verse 14, he says, I'm gonna turn my people. I'm gonna return. When you hear that word, that means that's a restoration message. That's a restoration word that God's gonna restore. How many of you know that's why I said today that Satan has to give it back to you? He has to give it up. It's payday. Come on. How many of you know this is not just a message, this is a prophetic uh, roadmap so that we can have the faith, anticipation, expectation that what God says is gonna happen is gonna happen. <laughs> Joel chapter three, verse one. I shall reverse the captivity and restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, remember? Verse two now, watch this. I will gather also all nations. I'll gather all nations. And some of you need to hear this. No one will escape the day of the Lord. Now this includes, uh, I'm talking about nations. It includes Danama nations. It includes Amaja nations. It includes uh, divinations. Come on now. As I've said many times, uh, we're created, uh, we, we're, we're created, uh, come on now, we're created in God's image. But we try to make God uh, in our own image. And when I say that there's a denomination, here's what I mean. It includes everything marked by its own. See, denominations make up their own set of standards and rules. Amen. How do you hear that? Amen. And then when you look at imaginations, that means that has led us to our own uh, thinking, our own uh, creation, and then divination, it means we have our own idea of who God is. The word Jehoshaphat means the Lord is judge. See what it says here? I'll deal and execute judgment. Right there. How do you hear that? And he said, I'll bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. How many of you know, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God's going to bring everything that has exalted itself above the knowledge of God. He's going to bring it down. He's going to bring it down into the valley of Jehoshaphat to be judged by God. I prophesy to you, the church is going to change its message. On Tuesday, I spoke to some leaders that were here in the time of fasting for the ICAL, and I said, God is going to change the message of the church. The church has got the wrong message today in many settings because the church is not preaching repentance. The church is going to preach repentance because judgment is coming to bring us back to righteousness. We're not going to fix uh, our ills by intelligence and by intellectual property of thought. We're going to have to change uh, our heart condition for God to show up. And where it's not popular, it will become the most popular because the judgment will begin to become so serious and so severe 
that the world will shake from the judgment of God and they'll run to the house because when the world is judged, it's left empty. When the Christian is judged, it's left changed. Revelation chapter 9, put it up on the board. And verse 1. Satan is the king of hell from where comes the locust. Have you know, I leave this with you in a few minutes. I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of information and we're going to pray. Have you understand we sold our children? Look at me. We sold our children. I'll prove it to you. Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, prophetic word again, and saw, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky, Satan, Lucifer, to the earth. And, the angel, and to the angel was given the key of the shaft of the abyss, the bottomless pit. How do you know he was given the key to hell? He opened the long shaft of the abyss, the bottomless pit, and smoke like the smoke of huge furnace puffed up out of the long shaft so that the sun and the atmosphere were darkened by the smoke from the long shaft, verse three. Then out of, this, out of the smoke locusts came forth on the earth and such power was granted them as the power the earth scorpions have. They were told not to injure the herbage of the earth, Look at this now, nor any green thing, nor any tree. Now over in Joel's day, they were told to eat the shrubs. Now they're told not to eat anything green, but only to attack such human beings as do not have the seal or the mark of God in their foreheads. You see, a lot of ignorant Christians have preached about the mark of the beast. There is a mark of the beast, but the mark that I want to tell you you better have is the mark of God. There, be, there better be a mark on you that gives evidence that you know God. They traded boys for prostitution. The word boys, oh, I, I wish I had, oh, you got to hear this. The word boys is not like the word benai or ben, like son, which Joseph's brother was named Benjamin. It's not that same son, which means son of a parental relationship. This word used in here in Joel is a Hebrew word for boys that means vulnerable and without fathers. You have sold your boys to prostitution. How many of you know we keep saying that the problem in America today is that we have no fathers and the fathers aren't at home and the fathers by doing it because fathers give identity have sold the children, their boys into prostitution. Not sexual always. But saints, I'm talking about prostituting, meaning the same thing as it says, the harlot was the, was the Babylonian church. We took what was precious, moved it out of the borders of the house of God, put it in the streets and said, you're on your own. Wow. How do you hear this today? Jesus ministered to the little children. He even said, suffer not the little ones to come unto me, for such is the kingdom. Matthew 18, 6, he warned not to offend them. Do you know what the Greek word there means? In the English language, it means don't scandalize them. Look at what the Catholic Church has done. By, molest, by molesting all these boys. Religion is, is a horrible thing. You still listening to me today? Yes. And saints, what we've done, we have to stop and repent. We've said, let's amuse or give amusement to our children. 
Let's let them get video games and let them stay at home. And they don't want to always come to church. And we don't need them to go to youth group. And we've done all these things by a religious thing. And the next thing you know, these children grow up and don't want to come in the house of God. The harlot in Joel 3.3 3 is the definition of the church that knows no shame. She also sold out their daughters to her whorish system, Babylonian system, the culture, the new religion. The word sold expresses the act of betrayal like Judas. When it says they sold them, it means they betrayed them. Wow. Zechariah 8. Oh, I, again, but go to verse 5 if you want. Zechariah 8, 5. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. It's God's promise of restoration to Zion. How many of you know there is a day coming where God's going to pour out his spirit on the sons and daughters uh, of the book of Joel, of what Peter prophesied? And he said, in that day, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. They shall dream dreams and have visions. Uh, they're coming back to the house of God. They're coming back to the house of God. They're coming back to the house of God. Joel 3, 7. As God took Joseph and raised him out of a pit where they had sold him. I'm telling you, verse 6 says the word, the Grecians have said he gave them. Look what it says there. He said, we sold your sons and daughters, uh, uh, sons of the Grecians, and they've removed them. You know what that means? You know what the word means, Grecians? It literally means oh, we sold them to those of the mud people, the people who create pits. Joseph was thrown in a pit, but he had a dream. How many kids are in the pit in this city, in this nation? They're in the pits of the miry muck. God, in Jesus' name, activate their dream. Activate their dream. Let their dream begin to work in them and convict them. God, send those that will rescue them out of the pit and bring them up till they can find themselves once again leading the nation because we need a move of God. That word rise, Joel 3, 9 through 12, the word rise in verse 7 means to open their eyes, to wake them literally up to stir them, to incite them. Just like God raised up the son of that woman on, that Elijah went and she, he was dead. Look what the Bible says. Elijah went and laid on the boy and breathed into him. Panuma came inside. We need prophets today that will roar and lift up their voice and breathe life back into a generation. We need prophets today that will roar and lift up their voice uh, and breathe life uh, back into a generation. Verse 8 says, they're going to sell your sons and daughters to every nation into the hands of Judah. They'll become the property of the Sabaeans. Do you know what that word Sabaeans means? It means seven oath. It means God said, I'm going to go get them and I'm going to sell them back to a covenant. A seven oath. It means I'm going to bring them back into covenant relationship. I want you to stand on your feet with me right now. I want you to say with me, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for those that are in pits right now. Come on, pray with me right now. Pray with me right now. I need some young people. Now, I'm not talking about 30-year-olds. I'm talking about young. Put some kids in here. Get in here. Young people. Young people. Get inside there. This is a pit, and they're in this pit, and they're, they're, they're captured. They're captured by the video games. They're captured by the drugs. Uh, look, drugs, heroin use is on a rise like never before. Up in Maine, they've had to call the National Guard out. 
because the heroin addiction, heroin use is at an all time high. Because the church has been an arrogant church people that only care about, have you seen my new car? Who cares about your car? There are kids today in this city of Baltimore. They're in pits. Look at these kids. They can't, we can't get them. We can't get them out. We can't set them free. We can't get them out. They're locked up. They're in uh, these, uh, these pits. Thank God uh, they had a dream. Uh, thank God Joseph uh, has a dream. Uh, Father, I pray for these here that the dream that's in them uh, will come alive. Uh, I speak to the dream in them and I pray activate it. Activate it. Activate it. Activate the dream, God. Activate the dream. I want you to clap your hands, stomp your feet, and I want you to shout unto God as though you were trying to cause the ceiling to drop out of this building. I want you to do that until I tell you to stop. And I want you to watch what's going to happen because God's church is going to roar. God's church is going to roar. God's church is going to roar. God's church. Uh, it said that out of Zion would come a roar. Come on, clap your hands. Clap your hands. of our stupidity to lull us into selfishness where we miss the prophetic moment of God. Lord, I pray that when we shout and declare these kids to come out of the pit, that Lord, the church will delight in the corn, will delight in the oil, will delight in the wine like never before that God young people will come into the house of God they will come from the universities they will come from the high schools and they will walk in and they will sense there's something alive in the house of God there's something going on in the house of God they'll see life they'll see you alive they'll see you alive they'll 